One of the rules the mob has usually followed, as far as murders go, is that killing a member of law enforcement is off limits. The obvious reason is law enforcement itself will stop at nothing to hold those responsible. If we reflect back to 1989, an undercover DEA agent, Everett Hatcher, was shot to death on February 28th of that same year while meeting a drug dealer he was targeting named Gus Faraci on Staten Island. Following Hatchet's murder, a nationwide manhunt took place for Faraci, and the FBI put him on their 10 most wanted list. Consequently, law enforcement came down on the mob. That pressure put Faraci directly in the mob's crosshairs. And it was the mob, not law enforcement, who ultimately caught up with Faraci, who was killed on November 17, 1989, in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Almost a decade later, in 1997, an NYPD police officer was targeted and killed by a Colombo hit team. Let's get into it. At around midnight of August 25th, 1997, off-duty police officer Ralph Doles had just finished his 3 to 11 tour at a housing project in Coney Island, Brooklyn, and pulled up to his house at 2111 East 19th Street in Sheepshead Bay, also in Brooklyn. He exited his Cutlass Supreme Oldsmobile and was approached by two guys. When he noticed them, he said, what's up? And they both shot him with a 44 Magnum and a 45 five times. Doles managed to stagger into his apartment and collapse on the floor. He was found by his wife, who was home with their three-month-old daughter. Doles was rushed by ambulance to Coney Island Hospital, but died as a result of his injuries the following morning. Prior to his death, he told detectives that he was shot by three white males. Killing a cop whether he's off-duty or not, is a very big deal. But the decision to do so is that much greater. A Colombo hit team just doesn't make the decision on their own to carry out something of this magnitude. They have to receive an order to do it. And that's exactly what happened. The order to kill Ralph Dolls was given to Tommy Schatz Gioli, who at the time was a captain of a Colombo crew since 1994, a crew that operated primarily in Brooklyn and Long Island. Gioli's crew included very capable associates who participated in numerous murders, especially during the Colombo War, which took place a few years earlier. The order to kill Doles came from Joe Waverly Cacase, the family's consigliere at the time. As a member of the family's administration, Cacase didn't need to explain his reasoning for wanting Doles killed. Gioli then gave the assignment to one of his trusted associates, Dino Calabro, and according to Calabro, Gioli took him to Dole's block. He pointed out a car, he pointed out a house, and he gave me a little piece of paper with a license plate on it. Obviously, they had a picture of Dole's as well. Initially, Calabro was told the target was a Mexican guy who worked in a Queens club, which naturally he didn't question. At that point, it was now on Calabro to put things in motion. First and foremost, would be laying on Dole's to get his pattern down which proved to be difficult. This delay irritated Cacase to the point of him questioning Calabro. What's going on with that thing? Because it's taken a long time. As far as Calabro was concerned, he wanted to do the work. In fact, he was more than happy to get it done and figured it was his ticket to being straightened out. So after hearing Cacase's unhappiness, he doubled his efforts to get it done. Following one failed attempt on the night of August 25th, 1997, the Colombo hit team, consisting of Calabro, his cousin, Little Dino Sarancino, as shooters, and Joey Cavs Compitello, who was manning a crash car. They used police scanners to listen to real-time police chatter and walkie-talkies to communicate with one another, and they got it done. According to Calabro, they confronted Doles after he pulled up and exited his car. As previously stated, Doles questioned them by asking, what's up? They then shot him. Calabro said he emptied his gun. He watched as Dole slumped onto the hood of his car. Calabro didn't find out Dole was a cop until the following day. He seen a newspaper with Dole's on the front page, as well as all the media coverage on the murder. He immediately drove to Gioli's house at 3 Frank Avenue in Farmingdale, Long Island. But before he could utter a word, Gioli put his finger to his lips, warning Calabro not to speak in the house. They went outside and took a walk and Calabro questioned him about killing the cop. Gioli played dumb and denied knowing the target was a cop. 
Palavro then tried reaching Kakes on a walkie-talkie they used to communicate, but he didn't pick up. Palavro was upset because he knew Cosa Nostra rules was against killing members of law enforcement. He even suggested killing Kakes to Gioli. From that moment on, whenever they wanted to mention the killing, they would shoot an imaginary needle into their arm because they knew they'd get lethal injection if ever convicted for the crime. The case's reasoning for ordering Dole's murder was over a woman, actually his ex-wife, Kim Kenna. They were married up until 1996, and then she left them. Apparently, she began going to a gym, and that's where she met Dole's. And in a short period of time, the two were married, and she was pregnant. This budding romance incensed Kakes, because not only did she leave him for a Spanish guy, but the guy happened to be a cop. Ironically, her former husband, Enrico Carini, a Colombo associate, was a murder also ordered by Kakes for a botched hit. All three members of the hit team, associates at the time, were rewarded by being inducted into the Colombo family. Naturally, Kakes, being the consigliere, was happy with the work they put in. The first person to be straightened out was Calabro in 2000, and he was elevated to a captain's position a short time after. Saracino and Capitello were straightened out in or about 2004. Their world would implode on June 4, 2008. At the time, only Gioli, Calabro, and Capitello were arrested with eight others. The Eastern District charged them in a 17-count superseding indictment for an array of crimes, including racketeering and murders, although Dole's murder was not one of them. The first person to begin cooperating was Compatello, followed shortly after by Calabro, who had the following to say, Every ounce of arrogance and bravado that once been the bedrock of my personality instantly snapped out of me. News of Calabro's defection was caught on a taped prison call between Cacase and his son Stephen who told his father that the bicycle, a codename for Calabro, broke down, meaning Calabro was cooperating. Cacase responded with, ah shit, everything's over, ah shit. In 2012, Calabro and Compatello would testify against Gioli and Sarancino, who were convicted for other crimes, but acquitted of the Dole's murder. Gioli received 18 years in change, and Sarancino was given 50 years. Cacase was also charged with Dole's murder. But in November 2013, a jury acquitted him of that murder as well. At the time, Kakes was already serving a 20-year sentence for four other murders. In December of 2014, Joseph Compatello was sentenced to 12 years for five murders. In November 2017, Dino Calabro was sentenced to 11 years for eight murders. When all the dust settled, the only ones to be sentenced for the murder of Ralph Doles were the two members of the hit team who cooperated. Let me quickly mention the super thanks icon found beneath this video in a three dot drop down. Put there for anyone who wants to show appreciation and give support to this podcast. I found something interesting I'll share in regard to this case. An ex NYPD police officer named Michael McMahon Gordine created a video on YouTube, and I'll add a link to that video in the description down below. Anyway, he claims that on May 25th, 1997, which is months before Dole's murder. A street contact of his told him that he could help him get a job at Belmont Racetrack and invited him to a barbecue. At this barbecue, there was a guy who showed up who supposedly ran DC-39, which is the largest public employee union in New York. That person, he was told, was Wild Bill. Jordine claims that he eavesdropped on the conversation between an old man and who he believed to be Wild Bill. The old man told Wild Bill there was a problem in Brooklyn over some steroids with a cop. And allegedly, Wild Bill told the old man that he would use Gas Pipe's guy, Big Lou. And let me just say, Big Lou is Louis Eppolito, one of the detectives Gas Pipe had on his payroll, who was providing information and carrying out hits for Gas Pipe and Vic. Allegedly, Wild Bill told the old man, no matter what happens, Waverly will take all the weight. He'll catch all the heat because his ex-wife is married to the cop. Okay, here's the problem what I have with this story. Let's just say for argument's sake that it was Wild Bill. He's not going to listen to someone tell him there's a problem with a cop over steroids and immediately look to kill the cop. In addition, 
How would he know from a conversation that the cop mentioned just happened to be married to the ex-wife of Joe Waverly? I just wanted to bring this story up as a demonstration to how rumors and false stories are spread. Precisely this type of talk is what people put all over the internet and state as factual. 